Okay. The Bohe Manonje um, Oswald, maybe tell us in the chat where you're connecting from. Also, Gabriel, Paula. Irene's from Malindi on the east coast, the Sony coast of Kenya. Okay, welcome everybody to this webinar entitled Learning Methods Out of School, Blogs, Webinars and Courses for Practicing Researchers, um, which is about a book chapter that a bunch of us wrote about the uh, topic, the, um, the same title. And let me just get the presentation going. Let me just share screen here. Mm -hmm. And make sure that the various present things that need to be on are on. Um, hopefully you can now see the screen. Please just um, show an indication if you can see the screen. Very good. Okay. So um, our presenters today are Dr. Janet Sammons, Research Community Manager for SAGE Publications um, with Method Space, SAGE Method Space, um, now SAGE Research Community. Dr. Nicola Pallet, Educational Technology Specialist and Senior Researcher in Chertle, the Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning at Rhodes University in South Africa. Andy Nobes, who is at INASP UK manages the author aid website um, and the development of the author aid online courses in research writing and proposal writing. And myself, Tony Carr, educational technologist in the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at University of Cape Town and the convener of Emerge Africa. Um, and our agenda is a fairly simple one. We're going to go through the introduction phase. We'll look at a couple of broad questions about research learning online. We'll look at different approaches to informal online research methods learning. We'll pick up on some success factors from the point of view of participants and from the point of view of providers, and then have an open conversation about where we go with this. Okay, what we're going to do next is something called a um, waterfall. And the waterfall basically operates like this. That what you'll do is to put your answer into the text box and just wait a little bit until we say go and then all our responses will stream um, on the screen and we'll be able to see them all together. So the first of our items for the waterfall is how I feel now is. So if you can just put your answer into the text box and just wait a little. Okay, send your answers. Exhausted, excited, nervous, inspired, clueless, excited, excited, exci lots of excitement going on here, as well as a bit of a bit of exhaustion. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, and the next prompt for the waterfall is how I learn research, a way that I learn research skills and practices is. What's one of the ways that you learn research skills and practices? If you can put your answer into the text box.
and just wait. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, everybody send your answers now. <laughs> Collaboration research methods, um, more experienced researchers, listening to Janet Salmons, YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> so lots of different ways in which we learn research skills and practices. Okay, and the last one, research methods class, yay. So a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. Right, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, do a little poll about the roles that we bring to this webinar. And to access this poll, you either use the QR code in the top left-hand corner, or you go to slido.com and you put in the hashtag. Um, and can, could someone put that hash into the chat? If anyone needs it, the hashtag 3154326 at slido.com. And you can answer more than one. So you may have many different roles that you bring to this webinar. So what are the different roles that you bring to this webinar? And you can just start answering once you've got into the question in Slido. Okay, so starting out as a researcher, We've got one of those happening. Okay, and you may have multiple roles. Okay, so far what's leading is I offer professional development for researchers. Okay, so it's a tie between starting out as a researcher and offering professional development. Some experienced researchers as well. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a combination of people who are researchers um, and people who are offering professional development for researchers and some who are teaching or supervising researchers as well. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about um, our roles in the project. And I think at that point, the team will switch off video in order to conserve bandwidth a bit for everybody. Um, Nicola, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the project? Sure, I can talk about Emerge Africa. So Emerge Africa is an online professional development network for um, educational technology practitioners and researchers in African um, higher education contexts and well we had a kind of a research initiative um, with the an American professional um, organization the AECT Association for Communications and Educational Technologies and particularly the Culture Learning and Technology Division. So our Part of this, um, you know, right up for the chapter was about this collaboration and, you know, the things that we could achieve um, as a small group. Um, so tied to this broad as an, as an initiative of a bigger online professional development network. Um, would you like me to say more, Tony, or is that fine? That's Don't helpful. Wanna... That's a good, a good overview. Right. Um, Andy, do you want to say something about InASP and AuthorAid? Yes, I can. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Andy Nobes, and um, I am leading a project called AuthorAid. It is a, a project of a larger international development charity called InASP, which stands for the International Network for Advancing Science and Policy. And AuthorAid has been going now for about 15 years. It's a project that supports early career researchers focused on low and middle income countries, supporting those researchers to publish their research, communicate their research, improve their research methods and get funding for their research. And we do this via lots of different um, methods, most of which are featured in this presentation and in the book chapter. So um, I uh, 
thanks for letting me join this session. I look forward to the rest of the session now. Thank you, Andy. Janet, could you say something about the interest from the SAGE Research Methods community side and some of the other cases that you bring to this collaboration? Well, hello, everyone uh, from uh, Boulder, Colorado, where it's still very early in the morning. Um, so SAGE Research Community, Methods Community, which uh, formerly called Method Space, um, is a blog that is uh, sponsored by Sage Publishing. Um, we share open access materials. Uh, you know, once in a great while, we might link to something at subscription, but generally, everything that you will find uh, will be open access. And we focus on everything to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, um, writing about it. Lots of resources about academic writing and publishing, sharing results in new ways, electronically, creative methods, etc. And we always say that our um, at the heart of our approach is teaching and learning because we feel that you know whether you are brand new or whether you're experienced, um, we all have something to learn. And I think that was kind of um, the motivating factor for um, uh, working on this project. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, are there particular cases that you've tapped into that um, you want people to know about? Well, we, we also offer a, a series of webinars uh, every month um, that are free and are very practical how-to uh, oriented uh, webinars about um, you know developing your work uh, and preparing to publish. Um, we also, I do a lot of uh, video interviews with researchers and authors. So um, at least I think that it's interesting to be able to um, hear from people besides just, you know, reading what they write in a formal way. Um, I think, our, you know, our focus is to try to, um, you know, share, you know, the real uh, experience and, you know, the uh, roles and practices and struggles and obstacles, et cetera, with doing research. I mean, you read a research article and you're thinking, wow, you know, that was smooth sailing. And then, you know, but like in real life, you know, it wasn't, you know, there maybe there there were some things that they had to deal with. So how do you learn those things? You know, so having a, a, a kind of a place where, uh, we can uh, share, you know, kind of the, the the stories behind research, I think is important. Um, before uh, working with um, Method Space and the now community, um, I was a pro online professor for many years, did a lot of um, supervision of uh, research students. Um, and I've also written a bunch of books about uh, particularly um, doing research online. So, you know, I have a real interest in on the ways that we can use technology in, in a positive uh, way to to come together and and learn and uh, and use them as research tools. Thanks, Janet. Um, what I'm noting here is that um, the stories that lead to the insights in the chapter come from URSIs, the International Research Collaborative for Established and Emerging Scholars. They come from AuthorAid, and they also come from a number of um, research teaching settings that you've tapped into in other organizations, Janet. Could you mention what those other organizations are? So why don't you uh, go go to uh, the next slide? So uh, in addition to the uh, organizations you've heard from so far, um, I also looked at um, the Textbook and Academic Authors Association, uh, which you know I'll share links in the chat for for them. Um, this is a it's not an expensive organization to join, and it's just a fantastic community of writers, you know, across all different disciplines. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of, you know, very practical resources and, you know, things like, um, you know, legal issues, you know, negotiating your royalties and, you know, your first contract and all of that sort of very 
uh, you know, hands on, you know, kinds of stuff. So um, I look, you know, I've been a member for a long time. Um, I interviewed the uh, executive director and looked through, you know, all of their resources to see, you know, what kinds of um, offerings uh, they provide that, you know, obviously more on the academic writing side, you know, writing books or articles, you know, in their um, world. And uh, Stacy Penna, who is here today, um, uh, works with uh, Lumavero, which uh, you may know better by their uh, qualitative data analysis product in vivo. Um, but beyond, uh, you know, simply uh, trying to teach you how to use their products, um, they provide a, you know, wide range of um, webinars and, you know, Q&A forums and courses and, you know, different kinds of opportunities that you'll hear about. So I hope that, you know, as you're looking at this, you can see that, you know, we, we represent and, you know, grew from um, this wide range of types of organizations from uh, companies that, you know, are offering um, support to the research community as a part of what they do, you know, whether or not it's directly related to sales. Then we have kind of un university settings and um, NGO organizations. So, you know, we tried to get a kind of a interesting cross section here. Yeah, and there were three broad questions that guided the study. The first one is, what are you offering, and to whom? The second one was, why are you offering these learning opportunities? And the third one was, how do you measure your success? And in terms of what's being offered, there are a lot of different potential target audiences for professional development offerings in research. It could be early career or established researchers. It could be members, customers, or open to the public. It could be um, across a whole range of different kinds of technologized opportunities, synchronous or asynchronous, different kinds of duration, single event or multiple sessions, and different intensities of interaction. And the reasons for the offering um, include a pedagogical rationale, social, cultural, or other reasons for taking a particular approach, and the issue of alignment with an organization's mission, products, and services. Measurement of success of often starts with attendance, but then you need to go beyond that. And how do you get feedback from your participants that helps you to get a sense of their experience and their sense of the success? And then if their courses completion obviously comes into the story. Um, would you like to say something about this from the INASP um, or author aid perspective, Andy? Yes, sure. Um, thanks, uh, Tony. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, the, the I'll, I'll go through each of the, these questions and talk about um, what we do at AuthorAid. And so um, the, the, our audience, as I've um, mentioned previously, it's generally early career researchers and researchers in the global south or, or lower middle income countries. Um, and uh, the, that it, you, usually we we find that um, we get a, a very broad range of researchers who who come to our website for different levels of support. Um, so, some even um, who are at the stages of uh, doing doing their masters or, or looking for for PhD opportunities. So it's a very broad range, and going all the way up to quite experienced researchers as well. Um, those those who who don't anymore have their um, sort of connections with an institution. So. Um, and uh the it's so everything is open to the to the the public um as soon as they sign up um everything is uh free at the point of use um except for uh, s smaller projects so we we run uh MOOCs uh massive online open courses uh other online courses all the content on our website is is free and all the webinars we run and other events are free in terms of the type of technology, it's we try to do both synchronous and asynchronous. Our our history, um, because we've been going for, for over fourteen or fifteen years, historically we we aimed everything at sync at um, asynchronous content, um, asynchronous low bandwidth content. So we were we were focusing on providing training for those with the 
um, the lowest infrastructure levels, those with poor internet internet infrastructure, poor less electricity, so that they're able to access uh, low bandwidth resources and online courses, which didn't have lots of videos and lectures and things like that. But also we've run webinars um, and virtual online training sessions. And increasingly uh, the researchers in our network do look for live sessions and live uh, Q&A sessions as parts of those as asynchronous courses. So it's a real mixture of things really. Obviously there are advantages and disadvantages with both those two uh, two perspectives. Um, sometimes these are just one-off single events like webinars. Sometimes there are um, a number of different live events through an online course. So again, a real mixture. And with the level of interaction, we've tried lots of different things. So with with our online courses, we have some focused online courses which are very heavily facilitator run. The the MOOCs that we run also have a facilitator presence on those courses, even though we have several thousand people who do the MOOCs and, and the MOOCs are in research writing and proposal writing. They are um we have a, a volunteer facilitation team to be there in those courses as well as there being a peer-to-peer -peer, sort of a peer learning element because there are so many people on the courses at the same time um also we have self-study courses which are very much there for people to do those in their own people um to learn in their own time which also has its advantages and disadvantages in terms of um the rationale for these um these opportunities we the pedagogical rationale we do try to build in even in asynchronous mostly text-based courses we do try to build in um a a level of um presence both from the facilitator um the sort, sort of social presence of the course and also trying to build in a build in a, a cognitive presence so even when there aren't, lot, aren't lots of um, videos on the course we try to ensure that there, there's some content where the course participants can at least see who the um, who the facilitators are through a recording of an introduction. We try to ensure that there's a, enough opportunities in courses to be able to interact with other people where possible, even if it's via, via forums, just so that there's, there is that social presence. And we, we try to build in as many uh, peer assessment style learning um, opportunities there just to get people thinking, just to get that um, cognitive presence working in the course. Um, in terms of the the reasons for for the approach, um, because we are we are serving a very large global community across many different continents, we have to ensure that the the content is cult, um, culturally uh, appropriate. Also, um, obviously that that I mean our courses are are delivered mostly in English and we have to be uh, sensitive to the fact that not obviously not everybody um has English as their first spoken language so that's another um thing to to consider as well as uh challenges such as time zones um our our mission is very much to provide um training at the point of need for the, for researchers working um in low and middle income countries and our organizational mission is to provide access to, to, to researchers and other stakeholders in the research ecosystem in, in low and middle income countries. In terms of measuring success, um, there are lots of ways that we've tried to do this in the past. And this can really depend on the different intervention, the different type of training that we're doing. Obviously, um, we count the number of people who do things such as our MOOCs. And we we measure things such as completion rates, which is a, a quite a basic way of seeing how successful the course has been, but only from the perspective of, of those who have actually finalized, uh, finished the course. And the, our completion rates were hovering at around 50% um, at one stage. They started to dip in recent years, I think, just due to the change in expectations that people have about online courses and MOOCs. We try to take um, informal feedback through the course and an end of course survey, which generally gives us good feedback, um, positive feedback, but also some interesting critical feedback. And lots of people seem very willing to provide uh, quite in-depth comments in open text questions. But again, we have to consider that this is um, 
of course, from those who have actually completed the course. And generally, it's difficult to get feedback from those who haven't completed the course. Um, there, there are other things that we've we've mentioned that we've measured as well, um, because completion rate doesn't tell us everything. And one one thing that we wanted to to also capture was things such as people's le learning expectations at the beginning of the course, and then ask them to reflect on that when the course is finished and see if they've actually reached the level that they were expecting, and also their confidence levels pre and post course or pre and post event so there's another number of different ways that we try to measure that success we, we we've thought about and we've um, tried to conduct surveys a certain amount of time after courses and training events have happened so there, we we have done a few surveys where we've caught up with researchers who've done a research writing course for example about six to nine months after the course is completed seeing if they've had any success with with um actual publications or or grant applications and that's been another way that we've tried to measure the success of different types of of interventions so there's a different level of impact in MOOCs and in mentoring and in self-study courses for example so um, I think that's that's kind of a, a summary of the ways that we've um, we've looked at answering these questions in in the book chapter um, I think I'll pass back over to you Tony now Andy, thank you for that very comprehensive summary. Um, and now, Janet, I'll ask you, do you want to talk about these issues in relation to one of the cases that you'd researched for the book chapter? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start by um, just talking about Sage Research Methods community. So I've already told you about our content, which, I mean, naturally, from the title, you can tell that our focus is on research methods, and and then academic writing, how do you share what you found? Um, then in terms of level and, um, you know, from what we, so, you know, we, we're primarily offering a blog. So, you know, it's something that, that goes out to the world and, you know, whoever wants to read it can read it. Um, so, and, you know, we can tell a little bit from uh, some of our, you know, analytics, you know, who these people might be, but, you know, you really can't tell exactly. Uh, and so in terms of the content, I, I try to offer a wide range of content, um, hopefully, you know, to interest, you know, people who are at different levels um, and, you know, who have different interests. I want to include not only people in academia, but also independent uh, researchers and people who are working in, say, government or NGO, you know, kinds of settings, research institutes, um, who, you know, may not have, you know, kind of the professional collegial community that, you know, that does that someone in an academic setting might have. Um, it is, you know, open to the public. It, you know, it's just an open open site. Uh, in terms of the types of technology we use, it's primarily asynchronous um, with the exception of our webinars, which you might say are both synchronous and asynchronous because we have um, a lot of people who register, uh, their, it doesn't fit with their time zone or their schedules, and they you know register with the intention of uh, receiving the recording um, so they can watch it in their own time. Um, we don't, uh, uh, you know, so in terms of the level of interaction, you know, it's it's generally, you know, kind of from from me and from the uh, researchers who contribute um, to, you know, the people who are reading. You know, we don't have opportunities really for, you know, peer to peer uh, kinds of interaction. In terms of the pedagogical rationale, um, we talked a lot when we were writing this chapter about different flavors of constructivism. And I think ours, you know, you might say is the radical constructivism because we're putting this stuff out there and, you know, it's up to you to find out, uh, find the materials and and use them, you know, in the ways that will fit with your own learning. Um, you know, I think that probably, you know, for, for some things, let's say, for example, an author interview, maybe that you watch the interview uh, we, you know, or the roundtable discussion that we've recorded, and you think, well, that's 
that's interesting. That opened the doors for me to, to learn about a new approach. And, and that's all you needed to know. But, you know, if you wanted to know more, you know, we have, you know, there are the books and, and other uh, resources that uh, you can dig into it in, in more depth. Um, you know, in terms of the kind of alignment with the organization's mission, well, uh, Sage Publishing publishes books about research and databases that serve uh, researchers. So, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's the business that Sage is in. Um, and, you know, they, you know, really feel that it's important to um, kind of, you know, engage with the broader community. So, you know, there is a, you know, you know, a real, um, you know, desire to kind of share our passion for research, you know, whether or not you're buying the products. Um, and so that's really kind of the, the unique spot that this community has, you know, within, you know, a company that is obviously in the business of, uh, of selling uh, books and, and other products. Um, just, you know, briefly in terms of measuring success, um, I, I think, you know, for us, you know, the attendance and registration at, at webinars, uh, and because that's our one synchronous thing, we have a chance to um, see what questions people ask and what uh, their interests are. And, and that's uh, very helpful for us in terms of not only measuring success, but, but you know, finding, you know, the topics that we should provide more uh, um, information about. Um, the informal uh, feedback is really useful. And, you know, we look at the Google Analytics to see, you know, what, what are people looking for? You know, if they're on, you know, online, you know, looking for, you know, resources about a particular topic, then, you know, that, um, you know, that helps us to think about what kinds of content we should uh, provide. So I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Tony. Thanks, Janet. Um, and from a very different approach, Nicola, could you tell us about how the research professional development work done by OSIS relates to these questions? Yes, sure. So a very, very different scale. And <clears throat> I think the, the offering is quite different as well and how it was organized. Of course, all these different types and, you know, the relevance of these cases, we will still dis um, you know, discuss further that there are, you know, advantages and challenges and opportunities with, with all these different forms. And for those who are supporting um, researchers, you know, it's important, to, I think, to think about what the different approaches um, can give you and the impact of those choices. So the OSIS um, stands for uh, the International Research Collaborative for Emerging Established and Emerging Scholars, and it was about offering resources and peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, and it was primarily a collaborative research initiative that were, came about through an affiliation between two professional development networks, Emerge Africa, and then the Association for Educational Te Communications and Technology um, that Emerge Africa became um, affiliated to. And the even though, you know, so it's not research generally, but very particular field, it's about supporting professional communities in the field of educational technology that these two organizations have in common. And this um, basically, the collaboration, it was, um, there were organizers of a research initiative and they wanted to create academic um, mentoring and research groups to support members of the two different organizations. And the groups then consisted of co um, collectives of researchers and practitioners based in Africa and the USA. And within the setup, then established scholars were arranged into groups and intended mentors with established scholars intended as mentees. And there was an application process and mentors and mentees applied to join this um, the pilot research initiative in 2018. Um, and was shared through both organizations, uh, Emerge Africa and AACT. 
So, and the US-based mentors participated voluntarily. Some of the African mentors were funded um, from the Emerge Africa Network, and then mentees participated voluntary, voluntarily in the different membership mentorship groups. Um, and potential members had, as, as the emerging scholars, either a master's degree, a D, or a PhD in a field related to educational technology. Um, these were the kinds of people who were, were invited to, supply, um, to apply. And initially, there were four groups, four mentorship groups, um, and they had different focus areas. And the intended activities were, you know, peer review, mental feedback, collaborative research, um, and those kinds of things. And they coded uh, the conveners of the network, set up a charter, and the charter includes, you know, values like supporting each other as a community of practice to develop abilities to investigate cultural patterns in research capacity, technology adoption, and other collaborative opportunities. Um, yeah, so the and the areas identified for you know the different groups were critical approaches in educational technology, culture, the role of culture in instructional design or learning design processes, access equity and quality in open distance and online learning, and supporting historically dis um, marginalized and underserved learners, which is the group that I am from. Uh, well, I am a part of. So I was not one of the research conveners. I'm a member of one of the uh, one of the mentorship groups. And what we did, I think, was quite different to some of the other groups. We decided we didn't like the mentor and mentee model, and we co-designed our own approach. And I put that a link to a ch another chapter, which is on that in the chat. And we're quite, you know, we're, we're a small group of six at the moment. And um, yeah, but I think our, our big thing is, I think we still do a lot of the things that the, that the charter intended to do, um, like doing collaborative research and sharing resources. Um, and we very much still, I think, stick to the, the core values. And our design question that drove us and why we decided to co-design and different approaches that we wanted an approach that provided us with experiential learning opportunities as researchers. We wanted to learn through doing, doing actual research. We wanted to share our existing expertise and we wanted a process that feels like it supports us as learners. You know, we're still, we used, yes, we're researchers, but we're still learning. Um, and I think, you know, what, what we created was this collaborative um, experiential research, you know, approach that involves a lot of interpersonal and process-based principles and things that we valued in the group. In the group. And we realized that, you know, it was the, re it's the relationship focusedness of our work that drives, you know, of, of, in our group that drives us. We're very much about inclusivity and co-creating opportunities to enable uh, members in our group to become um, to, to to participate in powerful ways so through how our own experiences we actually became very interested in cross-cultural collaborative research and we did stuff on online interviewing skills um, you know we're working on stuff on around collaborative coding um, but our what came first has been our interest in the collaborative process. What drives our success is because we regularly reflect during our online meetings, um, even asynchronously, we use, you know, both asynchronous and um, synchronous tools, um, asynchronous, mainly uh, WhatsApp. And um, we look at artifacts, we revisit things from earlier meetings or presentations and you know, it's that human connection that we, as I mentioned, that that values us. It's not just that that we value. It's not just about how many research outputs we can get. And we don't use our, you know, attendance or you know as a measure of success. And we recognize that scaling this kind of collaboration is quite tricky, um, because relationship processes are quite hard to scale. Um, but I think that you know perhaps you know, colleagues who are designing opportunities for fellow researchers might find it useful and to perhaps rethink how you think about co-research and co-authoring um, with multiple people involved, if that is something that you are um, involved in supporting. 
Cool. Over back to you, Tony. Thanks, Nicola. One of the things I remember you talking about and other colleagues in Ursi's describing was how instead of at the beginning of the process yielding to a pressure to rapidly go for low-hanging fruit and produce lots of early research outputs, you took the time to get to actually know each other, to understand each other's interests, personalities, and priorities, and then made choices about where you are going to go with the research. Um, and that your group worked better than some of the others because you'd invested that time in building the relationships necessary for successful collaboration, rather than jumping over those steps and going into um, a very quick collaboration to produce quick outputs. Yeah, indeed. And we even going on, you know, six years, <laughs> this year will be our sixth year of working together. And just last month, Hannah um, came to visit South Africa. And we all, um, well, quite a, a few of us, myself, uh, Alice, Nompilo, Hannah, met up and had a lovely bit of a you know, social time. We did some work, but we did a lot, of, a lot of social stuff together. But it was good to, you know, as this group that has never met, you know, face to face, but had been working together for so long. Um, so that was really lovely as well. Thanks, Nicola. Um, and on to the next slide. Building on the previous slide, we have this wide range of options. Um, asynchronous and synchronous ways to learn from experts, peers, or through self self study ranging from very highly facilitated opportunities on the left-hand side through to independent study on the right-hand side. Um, and it's possible that each one of us, if you think of ourselves as researchers, may be able to benefit from many of those points on the continuum. And it's also the case that some of the um, organizations and cases represented in the chapter occupy several points on that continuum. I'm thinking particularly of um, author aid, which seems to be there in multiple places. Do you want to say a little bit about that, Andy? Yeah, sure, sure, Tony. Yes, um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think as I as I tried to allude to, um, I spoke previously. We we do try to do many of these things, and I, I think in in the table in the chapter we were kind of occupying <laughs> all of these areas. So um, I mentioned about about MOOCs and how that's that's probably our probably most successful or well known type of training that we do, just because of the number of people that we we reach. Um, but um, I mean, starting from the independent study, we we also have um, a a blog series. Um, it's uh, probably not as uh, as good as the the Sage Methods one, but it's uh, a, a reg has regular blog posts which we try to ensure are focused on important topics that that researchers face from methods to kind of publishing skills. We've in increasingly work um, uh, put on regular webinars. Uh, there are there are kind of small um self study courses which we've we've done we've done several of these self studies courses we've we've just released a whole new range of of these um and then we have we have a, a discussion forum um running in google groups which which kind of complements many of the other things and it's mostly used for sort of ad ad hoc questions or, or sort of sharing uh, researchers sharing funding opportunities and things like that um there one thing that the a couple of other things that we we do which are also um really important that kind of fit alongside what we do are journal clubs and and mentoring and i think that's because uh one of the one of the ways that we try to approach all these different things that we are offering is we have this this frame this what we call a learning and capacity development framework and we we see this as covering three main levels when we're helping researchers. Um, so one of them is building foundational knowledge, and I think that's what 
the 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 blogs and the webinars do in uh, cover these sort of foundational skills which many of the researchers who are coming to our website um need further grounding in and then the second stage is what we're calling skill strengthening which is things such as the the MOOCs and um and self study online courses to to kind of imp in, in slightly more um advanced and hands on and provide more detail to help with strengthening skills and then finally this area that we call mastering competencies and i think that's where these last two areas work one of them is um online journal clubs um which i I've sort of put under the peer exchange section and online mentoring as well. And in, in the journal clubs, as when you're probably aware of how journal clubs work, you everyone gets together and discusses a research paper and tries to pick it apart and note the strengths and weaknesses. And that's a really good way of um of peer learning and critical thinking. And that's that we we host those online mostly using WhatsApp groups. And then finally, there's mentoring, which is a really great way of really putting a lot of these things into practice. And, and some people, in fact, do several of these different things. They, they read the blogs, attend the webinars, join an online course, and then they look for a mentor on our on our system. Um, so that's where they really sort of start to uh, gain some kind of mastery over some of the skills that they've learned by really putting it into practice and getting feedback on on the things that they've learned, which is really important. Um, so yeah, there's this kind of a a, a, a a broad overview of um many of these things that we try to cover. Uh, so I'll hand back to you, Tony. Great. It's very clear that author aid is able to occupy almost every space on this continuum. And I'd love to hear from participants. If you're offering professional development opportunities and capacity development opportunities for researchers, where do you belong in this continuum? What do you offer across this range? Please feel free to take the mic and talk to us. If you're offering professional development for researchers, where do you belong in this continuum. And Stacy, I'm wondering if you'd like to come in here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm not going to put my video on just because uh, it's early here. <laughs> uh, so okay. um, I, yes, I think uh, at Luma Vero with our community and we do a lot of um, webinars, we're probably more in the independent um, side of the study, um, though we do have, uh, yeah, more asynchronous courses for people to to join too. Um, but uh, I, I, it's this is this has been great. I think I, I just wrote down a few things that I'm like, oh, maybe we could do that too. So um, thank you for offering this and um, letting me to letting me share in it for a little while. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and perhaps let's hear from Chankia. Feel free to turn your mic on. Okay. Um, and Nicholas put a question to the chat. Should we offer everything in this range or be strategic? Is another question to consider. Um, and it does seem that um, this is something for every professional development provider to decide. And some things develop historically over time. You suddenly find yourself doing almost everything. Um, and maybe you need to decide to do a bit less. And sometimes you decide to focus on one or two points of the continuum, simply in terms of your available human and financial resources and particular targeting. Okay, so let's move on again and see. Um, one of the things that Andy reminded me is that we had this very understated sentence in the chapter that referred to four essential elements for learning research methods outside the formal classroom, which include access to scholarly resources, ability to learn from knowledgeable others, opportunities to connect and collaborate with peers, 
and practical experience using the methods. Um, so what I'd like to ask for, from our participants is if you can say in the chat, which one of those you would regard as the most important for you in learning research methods outside of the formal classroom? Is it the scholarly resources, the knowledgeable others, the connection with peers, the practical experience? If you can tell us in the chat, which is the most important for you? I'll give you a little a few seconds to do that, okay? Got a message coming in. Chankia says opportunities to connect. You agree with Chankia? Anyone else got a different idea? Or the same idea? What's most important to you? Okay, practical experience from Paula, practical experience from Stacy. Ability to learn from others, Marilee, okay. Any others? What's most important to you in learning about research methods outside of the formal classroom? And Nicholas says, as a researcher, these shift over time. Deborah, opportunities to connect and collaborate. Janet says, connecting and learning from others. And what it seems to me what's happening here is that you're describing different elements of community of practice. And that's quite interesting. Um, and it seems that locating, connecting with like what Vygotsky called knowledgeable others or the knowledgeable other, isn't always easy for busy academics. And sometimes the knowledgeable other might be a world-renowned expert. Sometimes the knowledgeable other or others might be peers in a community of practice who just happen to know more about something that, than we do, or be more steeped in particular kinds of practices than we are, which raises the question, who is the knowledgeable other that you learn from or with? Think about that a little bit. We have a comment from Marilee who says, ability to learn from others because I am a novice researcher, because I'm getting started, I can tap into a community of researchers. And many of them will know more than I do. Okay, so here we have a grid that we worked on in this slide and the next slide of one, two, three, four, about eight different kinds of learning experiences or settings for learning, who the knowledgeable other might be, and whether we're looking at something which is synchronous and or asynchronous. And on this slide, we're starting with facilitated multi-session classes or groups. We're looking at mentoring one-to-one -one, and we're looking at peer exchange, critique, etc. And the knowledgeable other shifts in the slide, but in each case, it is other human beings. It'd be interesting to reflect on what it means when um, generative AI gets a little bit better than it is right now. <laughs> okay, so anything um, from the work that you're doing that's relevant to the opportunities on this slide, Janet? Well, because uh, the nature of what we do at SAGE is primarily, um, I think, you know, on the next slide, we don't really, you know, the, the opportunity that we have for peer exchange is more in terms of um, the contributors to the blog. So, you know, I'm always on the lookout for people who are doing uh, interesting things, who are not necessarily uh, celebrity, well-known um, authors, but, you know, people who, you know, sometimes they're even uh, still uh, graduate students uh, or 
you know, people who are trying new approaches and, you know, giving them, uh, you know, kind of a platform where they can share uh, what they're doing, you know, either by um, recording an interview um, or by, uh, you know, writing a guest post, but just, you know, in the nature of our, you know, what we have, what we can do, you know, we don't have the capacity to have, say, um, you know, a discussion with the people who might be reading uh, these pieces. So, you know, it, it just, um, you know, but I, I think that the concept of the knowledgeable other is, is interesting because it also calls on us to say, well, where am I knowledgeable and what do I have to share? It doesn't, you know, I, you know, I encourage people, you know, those who are uh, on this uh, webinar and are, you know, thinking about what they do in their organizations and people who are thinking about, you know, the kinds of resources they hope to find, you know, don't, you don't have to wait until, you know, you've become like, you know, fabulously recognized expert um, to, you know, have something to offer to, to others. Um, and, you know, I feel that, it, you know, for myself, I just feel it's, it's part of the kind of social responsibility uh, to, you know, to give something back. Uh, so, you know, as you look at this and think about, well, you know, who are the knowledgeable others I look to, but also, you know, how can I, you know, in whatever capacity, um, you know, provide that to someone else? Maybe it's just listening and giving them feedback and support while they're, uh, you know, struggling through something. Thank you, Janet. Um, and it seems that this slide is much more relevant to author aid or to URCs, with author aid covering many points here and URCs being particularly focused on the peer exchange critique or small group support. Let's move on to the next slide. And on the next slide, we have many other different kinds of learning opportunities and settings. And where the knowledgeable other sometimes is directly a human being, and sometimes it is the knowledge of those human beings embedded in materials or resources. Um, Andy, do you want to talk about how this relates to some of the work that you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's really interesting. I mean, I was going to say something about the what was mentioned in the previous slide, actually, but how it um, is related to um, the the other things that are written here. Um, and it's I mean, it, it's really interesting to think about how the knowledgeable other sometimes can be um, materials. And um, interestingly, once um, we, I remember somebody wrote a a blog article for us about how they had benefited from some of the some of the support author aid had, had given them and they they talked about the website itself being a mentor to them and particularly some of the the free downloadable resources they found on the website they talked about that as a mentor which i found really interesting and um the the i i mean the the, the idea of a mentor was the first thing that came that comes to my head when you think about knowledgeable others and me mentoring is something which which comes up all the time from researchers in our network because there's such a shortage of mentors and they're seen as the best the best way that a researcher can get answers to their questions um this best usually from some from scoping we did around with the members of our community the mentors would have seen, seen as the best way of unlocking the problem that they were stuck in whether it was a problem in their research project or some piece of knowledge or literature they needs to get hold of and it, it, it made us realize that um a mentor came up as the solution to that when there's this broad range of, of problems where people just needed um information at the the right information at just the right time to help them get unstuck and delivered to them in the most appropriate accessible way and that that information to be signposted because actually mentors are in short in a in really short supply and it takes time to connect people and to con contract between those those two people and so we realize that mentoring is only one part of the solution and actually 
um, it's you can have more impact through the right materials, the right information, um, the right data at the right time. So that's how I'm kind of kind of thinking about these um, different categories as a as a whole and how they relate to each other. <laughs> That may have been a, a slightly long-winded way of answering your question, Tony. <laughs> that was a very comprehensive way of answering the question. Andy, thank you. Um, I'd like to now ask Janet if she can say something about the approaches used by the TAA in relation to the types of learning experience shown on this slide. Yeah, just so the, the textbook in Academic Authors Association um, is you know, really um, offers both of uh, the kind of peer exchange in that side of the knowledgeable other. They do things like once a month, they have a conversation circle, anybody who joins, and it's, it's a very inexpensive membership. So there is not a barrier to entry that way. Um, so, you know, if you join and, you know, you want to uh, log in and just be a part of, you know, an, an informal conversation, you know, and, you know, talk about a, a particular topic about writing. Um, their, their webinars are uh, small, uh, very um, interactive, and I think um, very focused, you know, again, you know, they're, they're looking at the writing and publishing side. Um, the, so, you know, while they offer the, you know, the websites and the blogs and the email lists and a, a newsletter and a, that sort of thing, I think those, you know, kind of informal opportunities to to meet other people are, you know, are really helpful because as we know, writing is a challenging thing, you know, for everyone. And, and it's something that most of the time um, you're doing alone, you know, you're sitting there at your computer thinking, oh man, nobody else is nobody else has struggled like I'm struggling. And so to find other people who, who are, you know, it's very helpful, you know, at the same time, they provide access to knowledgeable others who are in specialized areas. I mean, for example, uh, lawyer. So, you know, let, let's say, for example, you have a book that's published and then uh, your, um, your publisher uh, is acquired by someone else. You know what? What are your rights? You know what? What can you do? Um, how long is the copyright? You know, can you take the copyright back? Let's say they don't want to do a new edition of your book. Um, can you, you? You know, can you take the copyright back and do it as a self-published? You know, those kinds of things. Like, you know, don't ask me. You know, like this is not my field. Um, you know, we need somebody who has legal expertise to answer those questions. So, you know, I think what one of the uh, advantages of uh, these kinds of organizations is being able to share, you know, those kinds of resources that, you know, would be very expensive for um, for us to to access if we had to go and, and, uh, and pay for them. You know, what, one of the things we put email lists on here and one of the things that I think is kind of interesting as an observer of digital culture is that in, you know a few years ago, if you'd said email lists were going to come back in style, <clears throat> I would have been like, mm, really? You know, everyone thought that was a thing of the past, and also blogs. You know, everybody thought, you know, these things were a thing of the past. But now, you know, look at like Substack and Medium, and you know, most of the kind of major publications like uh, newspapers and things like that now have uh, email lists where you can get more focused uh, information from uh, people whose work your interests you. Uh, and so, you know, that's something TAA has an email list. Um, we don't at um, Method Space Age Research Methods Community, we don't have an email list, but we do have an email newsletter. So, <clears throat> so I think sometimes those uh, kinds of resources, you know, are more targeted, you know, on a particular topic um, and allow you to kind of sort through um, all the different, um, you know, kinds of, um, uh, you know, the overwhelming nature of the web to to just access what it is that that interests you. Thank you very much, Janet. Building on what you just said, it seems that curation and focus are really important, um, and this is what we found. 
we found that organizations that offer research-focused learning opportunities can reduce distractions and cut the time involved in dealing with the standard um, public web or social media channels. And I think about you know, how Twitter was a few years ago um, with really thriving um, research communities and lots of influential researchers posting on Twitter a lot more than today, but they'd also be posting about other things um, and would be very, very easy to get distracted, for example, which is why the focus of a research focused um, organization, which has that as their main interest, really helps to use our time as researchers much more efficiently. I think this is really, uh, you know, kind of an important finding from our, you know, little uh, kind of case study research that we did, you know, looking critically at what our own organizations offer and what what uh, other organizations offer. Because, you know, the world, uh, the world has changed and it's changed, it was changing while we were doing this and it continues to change. I think, you know, the, uh, the pandemic, uh, is one, you know, it's one thing that that really, uh, you know, caused a shift, you know, because it pushed a lot of people who had not been as active online, you know, to, uh, you know, look for resources online, you know, in a different way than they had before and to look for community in a different way. You know, I also think, you know, I mean, as an interdisciplinary researcher myself, um, you know, that I'm not, I'm certainly not going to say that disciplines are no longer important or that people don't affiliate with uh, a scholarly discipline. I mean, someone who is a, you know, an environmental scientist is still an environmental scientist, but we have a much more interdisciplinary world. So, you know, one of the things that I see, you know, and hear about when I'm talking with people is that, you know, like, like, let's say, you know, in the past, and I'm certainly not, you know, saying that, uh, you know, let's go back. But, you know, in the past, if you were an education researcher and you went to the education conferences and presented there, you published in the education journals, and, you know, that's where you found your scholarly community. You found the people that you might collaborate with on a future project, and you found, uh, you know, kind of the support to move forward and the mentoring and all of that. And, you, like I say, I'm not, I'm, I'm not implying that, that that is gone, but I think now, you know, we have a much more interdisciplinary world. And especially when we're looking at the research side, I mean, on methods based say, research methods community, you know, I call it discipline agnostic. You know, it really doesn't matter what discipline you're in when you're looking at research methods. I mean, we look at uh, approaches like ethnography that in the past were uh, used by social researchers and anthropologists and are now used by business researchers. So, on one hand, all of these things are great, and there's so much stuff out there. Wow, it's fantastic! But how do you find it? You know, when we when we asked the question of what's important to you, and everyone said, "Well, we want to connect." Well, how do you how do you find those people? I mean, how do you find somebody else who is uh, struggling with uh, their first paper, or somebody who is trying to figure out, you know, how to put together a book proposal? And to me, you know, this is the real value that organizations like, you know, the ones we're talking about here today offer that, you know, you're when you come to when you come to our blog, you're not going to find uh, you know, what what someone made for breakfast or uh get distracted by, you know, something else. You're going to be able to find uh, you know, things that are focused on this particular topic. And um, you know, so I wonder what what others uh think about that, you know, that, you know, we have you know, on one hand, you know, uh, you know, kind of the door is open to to like everything under the sun. But on the other hand, you know, how do you find it, and you know, what helps you to find uh, the resources that you, that you're really looking for? Thanks, Janet. And in the chat, we have a discussion between Andy and Nicola, which is very connected with these issues. With um, Andy and Nicola talking about how some of the conversation that used to happen in email lists has gone into closed WhatsApp groups and become invisible to people who are not members of those groups. 
and Andy talking about the idea happening inside author aid of developing a chatbot to direct people to the right answers and places and resources um, without having to do a course or have long conversations in order to get there. So certainly um, a point of connection for the current developments in generative AI as well. Okay. Um, and from the point of view of people who are offering professional development opportunities for researchers, the success factors that we isolated, including focusing on excellent content, being aware of power dynamics, considering connectivity and language issues, and I would guess also cultural issues for global audiences, and also committing to ongoing review as some of the ways in which um, providers of learning opportunities for researchers can focus on success. Um, and let's move on um, to a bit of time now for discussion. What is it that makes online learning about research work for you as a participant? Um, and what I'm going to do in a second is to stop sharing the slides so um, we can all notice each other in the room. Um, and then we'll have a bit of discussion and then I'll ask, after that, I'll ask Irene to share the um, evaluation for this event. So what is it that makes online learning about research work for you? Or if you're a provider of online learning opportunities about research, what is it that you do that makes it work for your participants? And please feel free to just take the mic because there are a few of us in the room that we don't actually have to have a complex speaker order. What makes it work for you or your participants? Or you can come into the chat if you want. Chanke has come to the chat and said learning resources and time frame. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Because you'd be so welcome to. We'd love to hear your voice if you want to share it. You can just unmute. Or anybody else who's been thinking about this as a participant or as a provider. Billy. I see a one, one, on one of the things that, that is uh, always a challenge with informal learning is that you know, to to maintain the um, commitment to participation. You know, if we're taking a formal class, you know, we're in student a student, and we're paying tuition uh, to go to school. We're trying to finish the program. You know, we've got those kind of built-in uh, time frames and uh, kind of priorities. When we're doing something informally, then you know, we're, we're more subject to distraction. So I think, you know, that, that is uh, challenging, you know, as a, uh, as a participant. So, you know, then, you know, trying to find, you know, like what, what is it that can kind of keep you engaged? And, you know, when we looked at that, you know, the continuum that we offered uh, with the, you know, facilitated uh, sessions on one end, you know, for me, I think sometimes having, you know, that uh, kind of, uh, human, uh, there's a human on the other side somewhere, uh, it, you know, kind of helps you to stay motivated and stay uh, connected to the project versus, um, you know, just it being, you know, completely on your own where, uh, you know, it, it might be harder to, to to stay engaged. What do, what do other people do in terms of uh, trying to get, make okay, your own really thing a priority? Marilee, you've said one word, curiosity. Can you say a couple of sentences about it to us? Please put your mic on. We'd love to hear. 
Hi, Tony. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi there. So the, the question you posted is what keeps you in the learning process? And, and for, for me, that's uh, curiosity. You have to be curious to, to want to engage. Um, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's it for me. Okay, Marudi, I'm going to push you further about this one. Because it has to be more than the curiosity that would be, drive you to watch the next episode in a Netflix series. What is it specific about, specifically about this curiosity? Um, I think it's always a, 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 a drive to want to, to know more and, and learn more and um, yeah, to, to grow. I think um, learning is one of the most exciting exciting things so for me that's yeah just a drive so, <laughs> sorry that's a that's just my um thank you that's, how, that's really what drives me <laughs> would anyone like to build on what marily is saying about curiosity as a driver or say something else about what keeps you with the learning process and learning about research methods and practices and you can come into the chat or you can take the mic. All yours. Um, Nicola, I know that you've been on a pretty exciting research journey over several years. What was it that drove you at the early stage of the process? interesting question but I think it it was more you know going to a conference and and having that opportunity and and being you know it was my, one of my first publications and and I think that that encouraged me and just attending you know webinars having conversations with colleagues who were more um esteemed and you know uh, researchers I think all, all the little things help. It's actually a combination and having really good, um, I'd say really good in-person mentors early in my career. I think that that helped a lot. Thank you. So this role about people again, mentors, people would help you keep you with it. People who would um, provide information and encouragement and share their experience, et cetera. Does anyone else here relate to that? I think you, know, like you said, uh, Nicole, about having uh, the in-person experiences. So for those of us who are in, in an entirely online uh, environment, we obviously don't have that kind of opportunity, but where there is a chance for uh, kind of a hybrid experience where you can uh, offer the opportunities for people to meet and, you know, make that kind of personal connection, you know, as you were saying before, you know, to have those informal, you know, kind of friend times, you know, having a, uh, you know, a cup of coffee, going for a meal, finding out about, you know, where they live and their families and, you know, their life and what motivates them to do what they're doing, you know, is, is great. So, you know, if we can't have that in person, uh, opportunity, you know, how can we provide those kind of more uh, informal uh, conversations? And, you know, that's why I thought the the idea of the conversation circles with the TAA uh, organization, you know, was uh, an interesting approach. So, you know, it's just a uh, log in and, and have, you know, talk, talk with a group of people who are dealing with the same things you're dealing with, uh, you know, that you know, that's different than than just, you know, say going to a webinar and, and, and being, you know, more in a listening mode. So, you know, as, as providers, you know, how can we, uh, you know, think about opportunities that will give people the chance to make those connections that I think then, you know, do, you know, help to keep you motivated. Thanks, Janet, and thanks, Nicola. And I see a comment from Andy in the chat as well. Um, 
And I see Marily talking about sharing learning as a key driver as well. But what I'm also wondering about here is that this doesn't work unless you have a very strong sense of purpose in developing your capacity as a researcher. It doesn't work as a compliance exercise. It doesn't work just because you have to go tick on some research in order to meet the requirements of your employment contract. Yeah. Okay. And Nicholas saying, when you have good in-person experiences, do you want to try to do this well online or in a different way, maybe? And it also relates to the whole story about, doesn't it, about making good connections online. Because many of the people in Ursis had never met face to face, but they were able to collaborate online and work together well online because they'd taken the time and made the effort to build the relationships. And that sense of strong shared online presence um, really is about facilitation, um, really is about thinking deeply and well about online experiences as being more than just pale shadows of face-to-face -face experiences. I think we're getting towards the end of the time, and I would like to note um, the post that was made by Irene in the chat, which has the link to the feedback form. And thank you for posting that again, Irene. So we've got triple reinforcement here. I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody and to ask the members who, um, of the panel today just for a couple of words or a sentence in closing. And let's start with you, Andy. Um, yes, I mean, yeah, that's a... Okay. Thanks, um, Tony. Um, I mean, for me, I, I guess the, the thing that I found most interesting, um, sort of thinking about what really works for researchers who aren't part of the, who don't get the formal training, aren't part of the formal classroom, was those four elements. I, I just found that really interesting. It, it resonated, resonated with me on the work we do and the work we need to continue doing. So ensuring that there's continued access to scholarly resources and that there's this there's a knowledgeable other out there somewhere, um, no matter what kind of format it's in. And also tying this all, I guess this is related to the last discussion point, tying this all around to um practical uh practical problems that uh researchers are facing. Thank you, Andy. Janet. Well, you know, a couple of the words that came up here about curiosity and, you know, passion, you know, are, are really important and, you know, sometimes hard to to maintain, you know, as, as your career goes on and you're, you know, distracted and busy and have all sorts of requirements. So, you know, having a, this kind of learning experience to me, you know, is, uh, you know, really uh, kind of keeps the fires uh, burning, shall we say. But, you know, to me, you know, part of that passion comes from a, a real sincere belief that, you know, we need more good research. We have so many problems in the world. You know, there's so many issues that are going on that we need to understand. And, you know, we don't need to only understand them from the, you know, point of view of, um, say, established um researchers who are in positions that have, you know, lots of uh, resources and support systems, um, we we need to hear from, you know, all kinds of people. You know, we're, we're swamped with, I think, you know, more and more garbage online. We talked about the kind of uh, trying to sift through, you know, wade through the internet to find what you're looking for. You know, I think that's, you know, more overwhelming than ever. Um, so, yeah. You know, I just um, think that it's important for us to to both, 
you know, continue to offer whatever it is that we can offer, even if, whether it's as an individual or an organization, um, and to, you know, continue to support, um, you know, the scholarly uh, conversation in whatever form, because, uh, I, you know, I think we really need that. And the last thing that I will say, you know, these are the things that kind of make me get up at five o'clock in the morning to uh, be a part of this type of conversation is that, you know, when I have these experiences, when I'm on the webinars that we offer with, you know, people from all over the world, I feel like this is the world that I want to be a part of, you know, not the uh, the world where we're bombing each other and, you know, screaming about something or other, but you know, th this world where we can uh, respect and learn from each other and, you know, get a, you know, a better sense of uh, kind of, you know, the, the, the big picture of, of, you know, we're all in this together. So, um, you know, I just uh, really, you know, appreciate having this uh, chance to be with you and uh, I'll look forward to uh, any input that anyone has. If you have an idea for something you would like to contribute um, or you'd like to, you know, join us for one of the webinars, um, you know, would just be really uh, happy to have you be a part of it. Janet, thank you very much for your insights and for your willingness to do the early morning start. <laughs> and, for, and very fortunately, now the day stretches before you. Nicola. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always so fascinated because there's so many options out there. And I think I'm also, I also see myself as still learning. There's new things we have to learn about now, AI and research and all sorts of things <laughs> that I think these opportunities and the different kinds, um, whether you're designing opportunities for better researchers or looking for these are kinds of opportunities for yourself, I think are gonna be really, really important. And it's been lovely to work with both, you know, Andy, Janet and Tony on this. So thank you to you and to our colleagues who have joined us today. Thank you very much, everybody. And dear participants in the room, um, are there any takeaways that you have, any juicy takeaways as a result of your wonderful persistence in being here for the whole of the event, um, or even if you just arrived a few minutes ago, any takeaways from what you've got today? Feel free to put those into the chat and then we will, in a couple of minutes, close the room. And don't forget the feedback form. Ah, use WH questions to design. Are you talking about the what, the how, the who, etc.? Is that what you're talking about, Chankia? And the how obviously is a with a with an invisible W. Great. Okay. Any other takeaways? Happy to hear human connection. Relationships are most important. Yep. Even if the human connections sometimes are embedded, embedded in resources, it's still human connection. And thank you very much for those inputs. And I think it's time for us to say a very big thank you to everybody <laughs> and it's been great to have this chance to talk with you all cheers and if you want to put in your vids and wave goodbye across the known universe you're welcome to do that <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, that's nice.